start our session. Uh, good evening, uh, dear participants of the forum. My name is uh, Sergei Medvedev. I'm the professor of the uh, Higher School of Economics, and I'm the moderator of the session Memory Space, who and what should the city remember? I guess it's pretty important city because uh, Madler, if I'm not mistaken, said that city is a book. It's not just the uh, sum of the buildings of people, of uh, interaction of people, relationship, not just the sum of some digital reality and quantity of bytes, but also the uh, place of memory as well. And uh, along the line of the growth of the global cities, they become like the memory spaces. Uh, so we can perceive it as memorial structure. So and here we are asking this question, who owns this uh, memory? Who builds it up? Uh, whose memory is the most important one? And uh, the city is this place where the fight, like the war for memory, uh, happens between the citizens and uh, authorities, between public and uh, business, between uh, social and state narrative concepts. And I guess our speakers will talk about that. And besides that, we have to understand that memory is not just monuments, not just the plaques, but also memory is some kind of a civil rituals. Uh, this memory could be organic, some uh, memory of uh, the trees like uh, uh, memorial oaks or others, uh, memory of the sound as our British friend will speak about. So all these things could be like a fabric of the uh, a live organism of the living organism of the city. So we have four speakers, and one by one they will be given the floor for short, about five minute remark, uh, speech, and then we'll have several questions in the framework of the panel, and then we'll open up our panel for discussions and we'll wait for your questions. Then uh, within one hour we will speak up comprehensively to the most extent. And uh, so we'll uh, start with Pavel uh, Gnilaribov, Employee Museum of Moscow. Uh, I would like to ask Pavel, what happens uh, uh, when uh, the liberalization of uh, city space uh, is implemented? How we transfer from the uh, whole uh, narrative of the city to some kind of multi-voices um, description of the memory of the city. I will try to be uh, as short as possible. The first thing, in the beginning of the 20th century and a bit later, anthropologists and sociologists implemented this concept, uh, the right for the city, and a bit wider for the city space. I can uh, bring this uh, city research that in 2017 was uh, the most violated right for inhabitants uh, was the right for the city space, S right for like planting uh, trees. You can't do it in Moscow. You can't mount the monument in Moscow. It should go through the procedure of approvals. And 68% of our memory rights were violated. And uh, you know that the uh, topic of monuments, uh, Ukraine, United States, Western Europe, we have our own little heroes. And I guess there is a universal prescription could, which could be uh, uh, offered to everyone. We uh, eliminated this monument of Dzerzhinsky. And now they try to improve this. Uh, place and whether it will be fountain or something else. So this fight will be uh, uh, happening for another 500 years or so. And Communist Party uh, 
try to uh, uh, make some kind of a sly trick. So they bring their cardboard Zerzhinsky. You can see this thing on the slide. And they kind of make their rituals, like pray uh, to Zerzhinsky or to someone else. And nobody's feelings are hurt. So they uh, hold their event for two hours, and then they leave. And I guess such monuments, such events for many m m margi marginalized uh, groups uh, of the comrades as these guys are. So you can operate like that. Then uh, monuments could be uh, Movable. Uh, if you haven't been to October Railway, so just recently they renovated Lenin on the wheels. So, uh, like uh, those wheels should be moving, and the very uh, thing, Lenin, uh, it was rotating by 360 degrees. So, uh, their uh, like railway station team, they made it by their own efforts. So Lenin uh, was performing, like in the theater, was uh, moving and relocated uh, in one uh, knot with some kind of a essence. So uh, this monument was made in uh, like 1920 or so. So what should we do with the monument, uh, monuments of Lenin? Sorry for this picture. It's the uh, plant, close plant of the refrigerating equipment when the owner didn't remove Lenin altogether, but he put Shrek nearby. So we are not fighting the monument of the past, but we're adding some new points to it, new senses. Uh, so when people put some scarf uh, on Lenin and then Lenin shows the way to other characters, and we're talking about reconciliation, reconciliation this year. But, uh, well, let's be honest. There is no reconciliation. Uh, I will make a compliment to the historical society of Russia. Uh, you see, Ulyanov, Lenin, and Kerensky, they were studying the same school. This was called gymnasium. And uh, they put this plaque on the building that they were studying the same educational facility. And my favorite plaque, probably Sergei saw it before. So it's characterizing the whole Russian history. We have to put this plaque uh, in the historical museum, just on the entry, right here to Rizansky uh, District uh, Emergency commission in the summer of 1918, uh, great Russian poet Yesenin was addressing with the uh, uh, special intercession about uh, the freeing of uh, uh, his neighbors in, this, in the village, which were held by uh, Cheka, uh, emergency committee. And uh, there is a plague like that. So at this very place, uh, 24th of June, 1924, nothing happened. So in our boring uh, surrounding, those plagues are drawing tourists big time. And when civil war was almost over, and to be honest, it's pretty shameful to Called this forum in the city where we have Voikovska uh, metro station. You see, in Tambov, they can't put uh, mount this m monument to Antonovsky uh, strike or uh, like rebellion. So uh, it was pretty famous event. So we have not more than 20, 30 plaques like that and uh, some kind of uh, members of parliament like Fyodorov, he's against of it uh, pretty often. You have to go to Shadrinsk of Kurgansky Oblast. It's the uh, object of cultural inheritance, but administration doesn't care about that. A dam 
Uh, so the same way as this scene from Titanic is pretty memorable. So they made this monument of Lenin and Liebknecht. Uh, so they put them in the uh, uh, consecutive pose. And then, of course, city management uh, right away renovated this building. And uh, they uh, got rid of this kind of a piece of monument. And uh, you see, that's the uh, uh, berry place, uh, like grave of Malevich artists. So we present uh, like our art, and this artist is one of our kind of a, uh, like spiritual uh, foundations. And they made it in uh, in uh, Nimchinovka, and so this is the uh, uh, s like a cemetery for uh, this great artist. Can you believe it? So uh, then a Russian uh, Russian fence painter. So it's like uh, the problem of colors. It's the most dangerous one. And I guess we have to be very cautious about that. This is a sample, very, uh, very uh, easy example. So this is not very valuable thing of uh, 90s. Uh, and so uh, this mermaid was painted constantly. And they were changing colors. So uh, this is a mermaid of uh, 2000. 14, 15, 16, and then they get rid of it. You see, Turkish guys, they could build something in several hours, and then some guy comes by, and he decides how this mer mermaid will look like. They have special ritual of Stroganovsky artist school, how this mermaid will look like. So you see, we're running out of time. Pavel, so that's why, uh, okay, let's be f more friendly and uh, let's listen to each other and hear each other, not screaming out loud at each other. Sometimes scream and shout helps, but uh, very often it's just the uh, shout into the emptiness. So what can rescue us, like save us? It's Saratov Lion. It's located in many dozen of kilometers, dozens of kilometers away from Saratov. So this peasant, which didn't have any concept about perspective, he was decorating his house like that. It looks like this line of Pirusmani. Pirusmani, who was this guy at first? Uh, the uh, artist of science. But now, when you come to any Hinkalna, like Georgian restaurant, you can see the uh, arts and paints of purest money. So that's why we can promote any artists, any peasants of Russia like that. Then Astashovsky uh, building like a house. It's a beautiful Russian fairy tale, not far from Chuklama, uh, very close to uh, the closest power line. And I will finish with the words of Zinovi Paperny, let's drink. Uh, for the fact that we are, that we are, uh, thanks to everything and despite of all, of anything. So we have to be citizens. Uh, to be citizens means to be uh, inhabitants of the city. Thank you, thank you, Pavel, for this uh, memorial things about uh, those one route. Uh, one syllable uh, words like uh, citizen and inhabitant, it sounds in Russian correctly. So right now I would give the floor to Sergei Mirzayan, first deputy head of the Department of Cultural Heritage of Moscow. So do you have any priorities when you're mounting uh, monuments, when you put monuments in place? Who has those initiative? It's some state authorities or private persons or what kind of memorial agents you are facing on your daily basis work? 
Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. After such bright introduction, it's rather difficult to talk about some state procedures. It could be a bit boring and not interesting. Uh, but we are, as the body of the protection of the monuments, we are called to uh, keep the past. And only after that to develop something new and progressive. And we are, as the body of protection, uh, the main method, the main task of us is to keep and protect uh, those state uh, objects, monuments, which are related to some famous uh, people of our country. So that's the main target of ours. So that's why it's our priority to uh, keep the past for the next generations. As, inher as the inheritance. So that's why any person can file any object for the protection of the state after filing all the uh, necessary papers and documents. Then uh, there is a special procedure for that. Uh, and again, I'm saying that we're talking about uh, the objects which were created in the past, not which are being created now. So it's like the set of methods and means which allow us to do that. There is a great example about that. We're not painting anything on the objects, but we have special set of the uh, supervisory inspection methods uh, by which we force or make uh, those owners of the objects of the cultural inheritance to uh, remodel or to renovate those objects. So that's our first first goal. And the second one is the uh, uh, mounting of the uh, new monuments. So Moscow is one of the cities of Russian Federation as the subject of Russian Federation, which has the special order of uh, creation and establishment of new cultural objects of art and uh, inheritance so let's keep our right I'm not saying that we have this right to put anything wherever we want but the matter of the uh, creation of new uh, objects of cultural inheritance uh, it has pretty multiple foundation in their nature. For example, about Zerzhinsky, we had many choices what to put in instead of uh, Zerzhinsky. And of course, we've got different response from the city, uh, from the uh, public uh, opinion. So that's why uh, some bodies are satisfied, some non-satisfied. You can be a, uh, kind of good body for good authority for everyone. But how did you see this public uh, survey or like some kind of a reflection? So there is an order how to where to establish those monuments. For example, talking about this monument of Zerzhinsky again, uh, uh, there is a special location in the register of the cultural inheritance for this monument. So uh, everything is done according to the law, and everything else is the matter of uh, politics and history and etc. So you're talking about procedure. It is the procedure, because uh, for uh, mounting some kind of a monumental uh, memorial object, uh, well, there is a special body, like a special committee at State Duma of Moscow, and this uh, committee uh, consists not of the officials, but of the historians, uh, uh, renovators, and uh, specialists in this regard, in this sphere. So they have a special procedure how to uh, work on this issue. And if this uh, special request is relevant to the uh, uh, procedures uh, according uh, the uh, putting in the register of uh, 
uh, Moscow rules for monumental monuments. So after we have the understanding of the implementation of the project, so then it's been launched and uh, for the joy of everyone, it's been prepared for the grandest like opening, uh, grand opening of the monument. Well, we have to aim to follow all the rules. It's better to have the order, right, and the rules than not to have it. Can you recollect any facts about uh, some, f some, some facts of the uh, request for the uh, uh, monuments, like or like interesting bus stop, whatever? Uh, so, uh, pretty interesting reaction comes. Uh, for example, in regard of a uh, mountain monument for Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn. And I can say that I get pretty many uh, angry responses. However, we have uh, the order, like the special act of the president to put this monument in place. Uh, well, I, I won't talk a lot about that, but I would say that those objects which are related to the memory, uh, you see, it could be uh, a building, it could be a memorial flat in which some outstanding person worked. It could be a historical, uh, like, burial place. It's called necropol. And, uh, it's, it could be uh, some kind of outstanding place like uh, VDNH, like uh, all Russian exhibition of achievements, people achievements. It could be a monument to Pushkin or, or Gorky. Uh, so you were asking about uh, what was uh, really uh, memorable to me. It was this uh, memorial uh, made to Corbusier. And it was made by young architects, and uh, it's pretty interesting. So then those memorial plaques, you see, they could be different. I just, those plaques were opened just this year to the uh, writer Vasily. You see, it's pretty interesting composition. Uh, in all regards, and uh, and you see those memorials, memorial plaques with, with uh, special bar relief. And uh, uh, also, we have the plaques like that. They're pretty interesting as well. Just recently, we put into operation special procedure, which is not up to the demand of the rules of memorial uh, plaques. But because uh, we didn't have uh, those special rules and we had some obstacles and barriers how to uh, place those memorial plaques. You see, there are different phrases, different formulations of, of phrases. Uh, memorial or, I mean, it's a play of words in Russian, uh, memorials or memorial plaques. So we have different concepts. Uh, in regard to those words. So those uh, plaques could be put uh, in relation to some uh, events or some names of the streets. Is that it? What are the other varieties? QR codes placed on buildings. You can scan this QR code and discover the history of the specific building on the web the dates in history. I'll be wrapping up. At this point, we're trying to conserve what is not officially subject to state protection, but these deal with amusing facts. For instance, this specific plague installed on buildings during a specific historic period This is a society for the promotion of a defensive chemical and mechanical industries. Now we have 
an initiative to refurbish these remarkable signs. And this is a pretty standard plaque placed on a cultural heritage site. Probably this information is pretty succinct, very brief, as expected. Here we can see this bakery inscription. Unfortunately, we have lost a number of ancient Moscow-located industry signs, like bakeries and other shops. Unfortunately, they did not make it into the 21st century. That's quite a pity. Thank you for this input. I'd like to give the floor to Anatoly Golubovsky, a social scientist and art expert and a journalist. And here, we'd like to focus on memories of trauma. We saw that the last address plagues. We keep memory of various traumatic events. And Berlin is the Russian Moscow counterpart, and plenty of human tragedies took place both in Moscow and Berlin. Terror, the Nazi regime in Berlin. I would like to turn now to Mr. Golubovsky so that you might probably want to cover the so-called building on the embankment and the contradictions between the various types of memories. Yes, thank you very much. Of course, as you have understood, this is not the building on the embankment. I have come up with a presentation which is related to a model, to a perfect project for reflecting on the trauma evolving in an urban space. This is Berlin. This project is entitled Memorial Places. It is uh, dedicated to the victims of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, in Germany, in Bayern. Following up on Sergei's comments, he was quite right about his points. I fully support this attitude towards sticking to procedures. But unfortunately, in Moscow, it's not that airy fairy, it's not that perfect. These procedures, despite the fact they are well described, as you know, the devil is in the details. I have experienced it myself. Sometimes memory is put into a specific matter. This so-called building on the embankment is not far away from here. And as an optimist for the last address project mentioned before, I run into multiple difficulties with placement of such plagues related to the last address project on our building. Due to political repressions, many people lost their lives. Yes. Pavel is suggesting that the exact number is 300 people who lost their lives, as he rightly suggests. So as of now, we installed 11 plagues. A number of points mentioned by Sergei is, were initiated by state authorities. The, what makes this project unique, this last address project? Not only it comes from a society of activists who care about the memory of those who became victims of repressions. This is a project, uh, a joint project, uh, implemented by the civil society. Everyone who wants to commemorate an individual, not necessarily he is a her relative, they can cross-check their data as per the list of the so-called memorial, the individual pays a sum of 4,000 rubles. And this plague is made to a beautiful design developed by a Russian artist. And this plague is installed 
on the building that was the last official address an individual who lost his or her life was seen at. We, the number of such plagues equals the number of people who care about these people, about the lives that were lost. As you might be well aware of, on the facade of this building, the embankment, there were a number of memorial plagues. And this building is uh, commonly referred to as a common or a mass grave. For instance, there is a plague to Yakov Christofovich Peters, who was one of the most cynical scums in history. He was uh, executed and, and later rehabilitated in the uh, year 1956. To my mind, I'm deeply convinced that I can hardly come up with an idea as to what should be done to these plagues. On one hand, I act as a historian, as a citizen. I cannot possibly put up with the fact that these plagues are installed to those cruel individuals. But on the other hand, there is no consensus in Russia and in Moscow specifically to conduct a sensible, a commonly understood memorialization policy. There is no such a concept. In turn, this uh, hinders these long histories connected to Dzerzhinsky. There is no public consensus as to the Russian history, as to what KGB and KVD and VHK are. What is really bad? What is wrong? What is a crime against humanity? It's not about us being fools. It's about the fact that back in the 90s, we did something else, not this memorial policy. In the so-called uh, security services, day the 19th of December, it has become a festive occasion. This is the date of formation of the VCK, which is the all Russian Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter Revolution, Speculation, and Sabotage, also known as the Cheka. So we have this connection between the repression related bodies emerging in the 1918 instead of wrapping up this continuity, it emerged in 1995. Hence the question, if heads of the FSB officials have the portrait of Dzerzhinsky and other portraits, what kind of a memorial-related policy can we really talk about? That's a very tricky question, pretty elusive. As a result, our last address Plagues. They are not far from a plague to Yakov Christoforovich Peters. And you have this dialogue between the executors, executioners, and their victims. There is a simple connection. No one would ever put up a memorial plague to a bad person. A person passing by, a simple passerby, once they see a memorial plague, they immediately believe that this person is a good one, because no one would ever put up a plague to a bad person. The last address plagues are not subjected to control of the memorial and monu monuments committee, because the legal status is pretty feeble and vague and not clearly understood. Now, regarding memorial plates, there used to be the so-called information signs. Uh, 
Not a, f a long time ago, when we were putting up a next series of plagues, we uh, found ourselves seeing another memorial plague, commemorating the personality of the deputy minister for the tires and uh, gum-related industries in the 80s and 90s. This person was in charge of the vehicle automotive tires conditions, which was uh, very poor, and it led to multiple victims across the civil population. And you can perform a survey across all the inhabitants of our building, of our block of houses. The result was negative, but still this memorial plague was put up following the survey. It's either the survey was considered to be invalid as less than half of our uh, tenants took part in the survey. And what did I see in those documents? There is a list of experts in the field of arts and other areas. And but we have Salavat Cherbakov, and you're mixing up the committees. This, comi this committee deals with monuments. There is a memorial science committee it is under Pichatnikov, and you're mixing things up. No, no. I trust you. I believe what you say. But the website of the government Moscow says that the committee for memorial uh, promotion the proper name is Committee for Memorial Arts. So please make a correction to the website. It is a different committee, has a different name, but doesn't matter. I see, I understand, Anatoly, but this sculptor by the last name of Kazansky, who is a pretty archaic sculptor, and the sculptor Slava Cherbakov, they somehow bypassed a number of procedures established. Well, let alone Vladimir. Uh, the monument to Kalashnikov. It caused a huge outpouring of comments from society. So it's a pretty gloomy image of our city because the appearance of this memorial plagues is not in line, the start not in line with our ideas about the future. We attended a forum and foreign-based lecturers showed us multiple pictures of the future. And when I see this memorial plague or the monuments being installed right here, right now, I feel not quite at ease. Thank you so much for this uh, talk. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have to give the floor to our English-speaking guest. Regarding the various memory and memorial projects, we can talk about Perm 36, which was actually the only one M museum that this used to be the Gulag Museum. Now it was con converted into the uh, Protection Museum. Speaking of this discourse of the victims and executioners, I would like to give the floor to our English-speaking guests, and I would like to inquire about the essence of the project and how can we ensure uh, the memorialization of society through sound. Um, so I run a project, just to introduce myself, uh, I run a project called Cities and Memory, um, which is a global sound map which covers about 83 countries, and that aims to present the sounds of the world uh, on a map uh, interface, but then also to recontextualize them and to, um, to help to think about how they can um, help us to kind of think about memories, particularly in urban spaces. Um, so. I think a big question is why sound is an important part of memory um, in cities. And I think um, if you think about sound, it's, it's a sense that's incredibly close to all of us. Um, it's the sense that we are all first aware of. Um, we can all hear before we can see. Um, and, uh, and 
I think sound is a sense that becomes, it becomes very, very close to all of us um, individually. Um, if you think, for example, about um, a tourist coming to, let's say, Moscow for the first time, and if you were to ask them what Moscow looks like, then they would normally default to something quite iconic, really famous, like um, Red Square, for example, or the Kremlin, or something like that. But if, if you were to ask someone what Moscow sounds like, I think it would be more likely that their answer would be something along the lines of maybe the closing of the metro doors or the, the announcements on the transit system. And that gives you an idea that sound is something that is, becomes much more everyday and, and much kind of closer to our everyday lives um, than the, perhaps some other senses. Um, and when it's, when it's so close to the way that we, um, we live our everyday lives, it can become very much a part of our identity. So to give you an example, um, I, I do quite a lot of recording in Italy. Um, and in a certain northern Italian town called Villa del Conte, there's a, um, there's a church bell that rings three times every day. It rings in the morning, it rings for lunchtime, and there's a bell uh, that rings in the evening at nine o'clock, which calls everyone, says the day is over, and uh, sends everyone to bed, basically. And the interesting thing about that bell is that every single one of the inhabitants of that town, 5,000 people, knows the sound of that bell very particularly and very specifically as if it's their own fingerprint or their own heartbeat. It, it becomes something that is so close to their lives and it doesn't sound like the bell from two kilometers away or three kilometers away. And that is played out around the world, not just for bells, but for all kinds of other sounds where the, the sounds that you hear every day become such a close part of your life um, that you feel incredibly attached to them. And, and that kind of shows you that sound is a sense that we, um, we kind of, um, it, it's very important to us. But actually it's quite neglected, um, particularly in urban spaces. So as an item of intangible heritage, it's, it's quite hard to get hold and, and to, to keep hold of sound. Um, you know, the UNESCO intangible, um, intangible heritage system has only been in place since about um, 2008 to actually capture and preserve items of intangible heritage, whereas the World Heritage Site System has been in place for, uh, since 1977. So you can see that intangible heritage, including sound, has got, is a long way behind um, the you know, visual aspects of memory in terms of how we regard it, how it's been preserved, and how it's been presented so far. But it can be extremely powerful. And it can help us to remember things in different ways. Um, so a great example is a sound artist called Susan Phillips, who has um, produced a couple of wonderful pieces of, um, of installation around the First and Second World War. The first was called The Voices, uh, and it was in the Hero Square in Vienna. And so what she did was presented the sounds of um, fingers on glass um, to represent the disappeared voices of those who disappeared during the annexation of Austria. Um, the idea being that the sound of glass is, is one of the sounds that's most similar to the sounds of human voices. So that installation was actually commissioned by a museum of Austrian democracy because they wanted something that was fragile and that was non-partisan, non non-political, and presented um, a, a very kind of gentle reminder, a gentle kind of marking of the occasion, rather than something that was more kind of forthright um, or kind of partisan in, in, in its own way. And the second was um, something she designed for Tate Britain around um, the Second World War, which was called War Damaged Musical Instruments, where she created some sounds um, built from instruments that were retrieved during the Second World War. So for, um, for example, um, a trumpet that was found on board a sunken U-boat and, and, and things like that. So by presenting, uh, by using music and by using sound, but by using items that had come from a particular historical context, we are able to recontextualize and, and think about them, the kind of the way that memory was used in those spaces. And that, that's confined to a museum, but I think it's very interesting to think, how can we take those, um, those kinds of items, those kinds of installations out of museums and put them into public spaces so that more people can recognize them and more people can appreciate them. Um, so that's one of the things that, that sound is, is possible. It can, it can help us to remember things differently. But in terms of how that can be done in urban spaces, it, it's worth asking who the different actors might be because there isn't you know, necessarily one set person or one set organization in any city that can say, now we'll do this, now we'll start doing this. So, for example, councils um, can have a great, uh, and local government can have a great role to play in terms of their, plan their policies around sound. So sound has always been perceived in terms of noise. It's been perceived of abatement of noise. It's been perceived in terms of how do we get rid of unwanted noise rather than how do we preserve and look after sounds that might be positive, might be culturally relevant, or might have some significance for us in the future. So there's something, there's some work around local government in terms of presenting positive side of sound rather than just abating noise. 
In terms of uh, museums, I think there's a great role that museums can play in terms of uh, presenting more sound and making maybe culturally normalizing sound as something that we should be preserving and appreciating so that once it's been kind of appreciated in that context, it can then be taken out more widely. Uh, of course, artists um, have, have um, in the way that they can think about sound and present it in different ways in different contexts might have a role to play, perhaps in working with councils or museums. But then I think there's also a role for the public to play. Um, and that's kind of twofold. One is if people listen to the sounds around them more closely and come to appreciate those sounds more, then uh, th there becomes more of a space and more of a desire for that in the future. So there's kind of a, a snowballing effect around that. And, and the second is that we're all effectively carrying around extremely high-end recording equipment in our pockets at all times uh, in our phones. And there's a great number of contributory um, sound projects um, that, that could be created whereby we record the sounds around us, um, we record what's going on around us, and we present them in various different ways. So, for example, um, a memory wall, where, uh, which is installed by sounds that people have, uh, have put together and can just be listened to. Um, so, you know, imagine if, for example, there had been a memory wall um, around the, the World Cup that's just happened, and you could listen to the various reactions uh, that people have recorded as Akin Fey have saved the penalties against Spain, those, those kinds of things. So they could be event-based, they could be city-based, they can bring in um, lots of different aspects and lots of different um, ways of thinking about sound. Um, and I think in terms of just a couple of other examples, um, just to kind of finish off with, um, public art has a really important role to play in, in how we look at memory and how, how we look at sound. There's a fantastic example in, in Zadar in Croatia, which is um, a sea organ. So there are a series of tunnels and pipes which run under the, under the sea wall. And uh, what happens is the waves uh, play notes um, th by, um, by virtue of the tide um, or by virtue of boats going past. And those pipes are tuned to represent traditional male voice, male voice choirs of Croatia. So there's a kind of historical context to it. It generates itself, but it's also created an exemplary public space, which has won numerous design awards, brings in tourists from outside Zadar simply to hear this, and also has created a space where local people will gather to hear the sounds, to enjoy the sounds, and to enjoy that space that didn't previously exist. So that's, that's a fantastic example of how we could possibly do that. And then I think public transit systems are, an, are another very good example of this, whereby you know, there are metro systems around the world, like Tokyo, for example, where you would hear different melodies and different tunes for different stations when you arrive there. And equally, you would, uh, um, you know, there are other metros where you would have a male voice taking you one way around uh, and a female voice around the other, so to help you navigate. But what if an individual station was able to play some sounds that had some historical or cultural relevance to the place that the station's in? So what if you heard that on the train and that's how you were able to identify where you were and then when you left the train into the station, that sound continued so that you were actually um, from the train carriage to the station to outside, you were held in a kind of continuous sort of mem memory bed um, of sounds. I think there are, there are various ways in which public spaces and public transport systems and, and elements like that can really help us to think about how we might use sound uh, differently in the future. And, and I think just to, just to kind of conclude, um, it's, it's about looking at what sounds are local and unique and, and individual. And, and there are some cities that are doing this quite well. Um, so for example, in, in Zurich, um, in the airport there, um, the transport from one of the terminals into the station will play traditional Swiss sounds. So it will play Alp horns and there'll be the sounds of yodeling and cows and all of that kind of thing. And it, it's, it kind of brings you into the country. So if, if you were arriving back in Switzerland as a Swiss citizen, that would be very familiar, but it would also help to embed people first coming into the, into the country. Um, and Vancouver does a similar thing with, um, with a cannon. So there's, there's a cannon in Vancouver which was installed in 1894 and was originally fired out uh, simply as a, to tell the fishermen what time it was um, at the same time every day. And they've kept that tradition on since 1894 and that's now effectively just become a sound souvenir which people will go along to hear and it represents part of oh, the city and its local culture. And I, I think, think that is me concluded. Thank you. Okay, thanks. This is uh, most fascinating. I'm only wondering if there is a project that collects the smells of the city. I would also like, if we're talking about like sensory memories, uh, so we should go to all senses. And uh, yeah, I would like to hear the sounds, for instance, of Moscow about 1900 with the church bells and the horses and the, you know, the bell of the trams and, and so on. But also I'd like to hear the smell of, for instance, of the medieval Moscow of the... Actually, there was, there's a fantastic app being displayed downstairs here at the forum, which is Moscow ARVR, which shows you um, scenes from Moscow 2018 and then also from 1900. Okay. And as you say, wouldn't that be fantastic if there were also sounds and smells uh, from 1900 that you could experience at the same time? Mm -hmm. 
Спасибо. Так что это очень интересно, да, расширять наше представление о памяти. И сенсорная память, она не только зрительная, мы все время думаем. Yeah, it's very good uh, when we think about some sensors, uh, sensor approach uh, towards the memorial uh, thing. So probably we will have some kind of a virtual reality glasses where we will be able to perceive the past. So we have uh, only a couple minutes to go and probably we will take a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, I can see this person in the last row. And then, yeah, th let's go with three questions. And please uh, tell us to whom you address this question. I have a little comment. Uh, as for the monuments and strategies of uh, erection of uh, monuments of the plagues, and then uh, there was this uh, appellation, uh, like the address to the uh, Uh, German uh, experience and then there is a third strategy as the uh, like uh, a dish like uh, a adding something to the existing uh, monument fund uh, so then we can use those uh, concepts like executioners or victims it could be the same person the uh, one person so yeah let's let's take this question from the Uh, middle of the uh, room. I, I would like to address this question to all who are present here. Uh, is there any sense to uh, get this uh, discussion not on the foundation of some ar uh, argumenting, putting arguments into your position, but uh, augmenting, uh, kind of when you have interface for another position? Uh, so this very attempt to uh, carry on the dialogue uh, with the uh, foundation that today I'm a victim, it doesn't mean that tomorrow I won't become the slaughterman. Uh, and the second thing, which is rather important, uh, according to this joke, when a Japanese comes from Russia and he says, uh, how come that you keep all these uh, words which you learned uh, during those two weeks and he shows his head and says here in the in my butt so I guess that memory uh, is not based on artifacts but it's been renewed uh, as the uh, capability of your brain and memory works in the same way as in Buddhism as like verbal tradition Uh, when we have artifacts, so they will carry memory much more than just a live person. So that's why, why do we distinguish like carriers of the information and the uh, and everything else. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your remark. It's pretty technological. And I guess that in the 21st century, it will have this kind of a decisive character. Today, uh, we have been discussing this about tactile approach. When you can uh, smell something or see something, you can see some uh, graves or some memorials. And I will be glad when VR technologies will get, will become cheaper, you know, as it was with uh, cell phones, uh, well, They were rather expensive, but not anymore. And all these questions like on Sukharev Tower, if they would like to see this tower, they will see it at one uh, good night, then an, uh, another uh, like beautiful gates or red gates. Then if you would, they would like to see this uh, Nikola cross, whatever. Uh, and to be honest, Moscow was Uh, raped by the 20th century uh, in the same way as our big cities because of the uh, totalized uh, past. Thank you for your remark. Well, as of now, we're still living uh, in the uh, real world, in the uh, real world with the concept of uh, Judea Uh, Christian aspects and I guess there is another ethical aspect which could be neglected but to be honest I wouldn't like to do that 
And this thesis uh, that today I'm a victim and tomorrow I will be executioner, yeah, in the uh, in terms of some experience, it could be possible. But to my mind, all the uh, policy of the memory, this uh, like slaughter man approach won't be uh, uh, restored, wouldn't be performed in our life. What do you call uh, the slaughter man approach? And you know, uh, now uh, Franco was taken out of the valley of the uh, uh, like uh, killed people. And so that's why this uh, very uh, ash of Franco was well, they considered it to be necessary to take it from the Valley of the Fallen. And uh, I, we live in this country which went through the Civil War in the same way as it was with the Spain and uh, with Spain and with the United States. So you see, in the consensus society, uh, Civil War won't end ever. So it couldn't be transferred to uh, this category where ethical principles are absent. So there is another question. Last question, please. Uh, Deputy of Donskoy District, Zelishak Vladimir, I've got a question to you, Sergei Mikhailovich. Now, Lensky Prospect uh, Building 30, Solzhenitsyn was working there as the uh, uh, convict of Gulag. And I would like to uh, install this memorial plaque there because I live in this very building now. And uh, we are renovating some sculptures there. So we work in the same field, right? But everyone deals with his own sphere, right? So then we'll discuss it afterwards as soon as we finish this conversation. So Donskoy Cemetery. Some graves, uh, for example, of uh, Ms. Ranevska Faina, famous Russian actress. So those graves are not in proper condition. Well, in Donskoy Cemetery, about 20,000 uh, objects which are uh, detected as the uh, objects of cultural inheritance. So uh, we uh, have renovated about 100. 20 uh, graves this year, and uh, in the previous years, we covered 2,000 graves. So we deal with Donskoy Cemetery, so I guess that in the nearest future, we will renovate uh, the most part of the object. So thank you very much. Thank you to the, our speakers. Uh, what I understood, that uh, memory is like a set of some uh, stale artifacts. It's not like that. It's just some living uh, fabric, uh, like the substance, which is the matter of the negotiations of the city circles. It's like uh, this good example with Lenin on the wheel. So the, ma the monuments could be uh, dismantled, could be uh, uh, removed. Uh, then monuments could be decorated somehow. Uh, and there is a great story with Zerzhinsky monument in the yard of the Higher School of Economics. And uh, one of the agreement was for us to keep this monument in the yard. So it was pretty interesting student project how to play around this monument. And this, uh, like, memory of people, uh, this Moskvaretsky Bridge, which is called Nimtsov Bridge now, and this uh, flower memorial, which is around this bridge and this place. And so memory is like uh, this living substance, which is being renewed and restored in our uh, mind constantly. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your speeches and for your feedbacks. Uh, see you later.